This video about critical approaches to literature will look at applying a Marxist lens. But first, what is literary criticism and why do we do it? Well, literary criticism is the study and interpretation of works of literature. Studying literature informs us of the self and others, as well as culture, history, psychology, philosophy, economics, and so much more. One way to study literature is to apply specific lenses and look for certain concepts or structures. And to help us do so, we can use established ideas and theories within the human sciences, such as Marxism, psychoanalysis, feminism, and post-colonialism. So let's start looking at Marxism by detailing a little bit about the man himself. So this is Karl Marx. Along with Sigmund Freud, who developed psychoanalysis, and Charles Darwin, who theorized evolution, Marx is one of the most important thinkers of the 19th century. He wrote multiple works on his economic and political philosophies, including the Communist Manifesto and Capital. Now, Capitalism, Capital alone is three volumes long, so I'll only have time to give you a bite-sized version of his main ideas. Essentially, Marx wrote critiques of capitalism and put forward a new political economic model known as communism. But first, we need a quick review of capitalism and industry. So for context, capitalism is an economic and political system whereby business, products and property are owned privately. The basic idea, made famous by economists such as Adam Smith, is that private businessmen start business, businesses or industry. They employ workers who they pay a wage. These workers can then use their wage to shop at other businesses or industries, making them rich so they can employ more workers. More money goes into the economy. The worker themselves can even save money and start their own business. Essentially, money trickles down. However, the, the Industrial Revolution happened, and mass-producing products was a new marvel for the world. Factory lines where products could be assembled cheaply and quickly made business owners very wealthy. Marx saw problems with all of this. He didn't see wealth trickling down and saw the workers as exploited and capitalists grew richer and richer. So he theorized. Now, the first part of Marx's theories that I'd like to share with you is his analysis of class structures. Now, Marx saw clear distinctions in the upper, middle and working classes. In Marx's terminology, the upper and middle classes are known as the bourgeoisie. They hold wealth, property and power. The working classes are known as the proletariat. Now, Marx saw class distinctions even among the proletariat, forced upon them so that they weaken themselves. For instance, industrial workers in the cities might look down on agricultural workers in the countryside and vice versa. This class division, as Marx saw it, definitely weakened the proletariat. Now, historically, Marx also saw that every now and then the lower classes would become aware of all of this and rise up and they would start a revolution. So notable examples of France and Russia, but there are many, many, many more. However, Marx also noted that these tended to end with the middle class taking the place of the upper classes. As we can see here, he's pushing him off the stairs and the middle class reigns superior, but the proletariat still remains poor. Now, Marx believed that this was often due to poor education, greed, corruption, or a mismanagement of goals. The second part I'd like to talk about is, his, is Marx's theory of alienation. Now, this is Bob. Bob's a carpenter who makes furniture. He's made this beautiful chair, and he's very happy with the final product as he's worked on it from beginning to end. He can sell his product to whomever he likes and will receive all of the profits. However, Marx saw under capitalism, and particularly after industrial revolutions, that workers were suddenly alienated from their products, from each other, from their buyer, and from the fruits of their labor or the full profits. As you can see in this picture from the 1920s, workers just do one small job of a larger production line. Charlie Chaplin also criticized this process in his movie Work. Now, Bob no longer sees his final product. He's alienated from the full product, as he's only worked on a small part of it. He's also alienated from the buyer. He has no choice to whom he sells, and he's never met them. He's alienated as well from the full profits of his labor. Instead, the capitalist gets wealthy, and Bob is not fairly compensated for and is exploited, at least in the eyes of Marx. 
I'd also like to touch on a third part, ideology. Many Marxist theorists, including Marx himself, note the important role ideology, or a shared belief system among people, plays on maintaining class structures. We can question ideologies and see how they perpetuate such class systems. Historically, in medieval England, for instance, the poor did not question the, the legitimacy of royalty as they saw kings and nobility as being closer to God than they were. They accepted their poor lot in life because of this religious ideology. Similarly, in some parts of the world, the belief in reincarnation or karma means that if poor people work hard in this life, they will have a better life in the next one. You can see how this ideology keeps people in their place. Today, globally, many people still hold the belief that working hard in school will lead to a good university and therefore a top paying job. Yet, figures show that for many people this simply is not the case. So why do people keep pushing this idea then? The American dream, or the belief that through hard work one can have a good self-reliant life and aspire to have a nice property and family, is also a form of ideology. And finally, even communism is an ideology. It is a very worthwhile task to question these beliefs, particularly against quantifiable realities. For example, Jeff Bezos makes over $320 million a day. Now, 98% of people in America will not make even 1% of this in their entire lifetime. Yet, for many, they still believe that through sheer hard work, they can be just like Jeff Bezos, regardless of the structures around them which might prevent it. Now, this is a pretty powerful belief, and it brings me to the final concept of Marx's work which I'd like to share with you false consciousness. Now false consciousness basically is people's inability to see exploitation or oppression because the ruling class's ideology has made them see the world in a way which maintains such structures. Poor marginalized people believing they can be just like Jeff Bezos if they work hard is technically an example of this. Class consciousness on the other hand is where the classes become aware of the reality of the oppression and the exploitation they face. They might, but not always, lead to revolution. So that's Marx in a nutshell. To sum up then, people are divided into classes such as the upper, middle and working classes. The bourgeoisie own the wealth and the proletariat are the working class. Even among classes, particularly in the proletariat, people are still divided, such as urban and rural, in agricultural, industrial. This weakens them. As a result of capitalism and mass production, the worker is alienated from the final product as they don't make the whole item. They're alienated from the buyer as they don't get a choice to who they sell or they don't meet them. They're alienated from the profits receiving just a small amount for their labor. Ideology or strong shared beliefs are a powerful tool which can be used by the upper classes to maintain oppressive class structures. The American dream is one example of this. And finally, False consciousness is an inability to see such exploitation and oppression, often becoming a tool used by the ruling classes. Class consciousness is becoming aware and seeing oppression and exploitation. So how can I use this? Well, when we read literary works, we can focus on class structures and ask ourselves some important questions. For instance, what is the social class of the author or what are their political beliefs about class? Are there any examples of false consciousness? Do the working class gain class consciousness? Are there any ideologies which maintain class structures and what are they? Are there similar examples in the real world? How do members of different classes interact in the text? And which class does the text champion? Which does it critique? And finally, does the text reinforce class structures or does it challenge them by highlighting flaws? Let's see an example with Of Mice and Men. So for a bit of context, Of Mice and Men was written by John Steinbeck during the 1930s. Now this is an important time in America. It's after the Wall Street crash and during the subsequent economic depression, which meant high levels of unemployment. There was also an environmental disaster known as the Dust Bowl, which destroyed farms and workers had to migrate across the country in search of work. Inequality was rampant amongst classes, but also um, with gender and race. 
particularly African Americans who were subject to Jim Crow laws which separated them. Of Mice and Men then is a story about George and Lenny, two migrant workers in search of a better life and their fulfilment of the American dream. However, given the 1930s setting, their schemes are likely to go awry. Now, the novel explores themes of dreams, loneliness, power and inequality. So as we read, we can ask ourselves those questions. Like number one, what is the social class of the author? What are their political beliefs? Well, we know that John Steinbeck once said, the problem with the working class in America is that they see themselves not as an exploited proletariat, but as temporarily embarrassed millionaires, meaning they don't see themselves as poor, but just poor for now, and one day they'll be rich because they believe so strongly in the American dream. Moreover, we know he was the son of a ranch owner in California, and he saw the plight of the working man on his father's farm. Finally, he wrote a scathing critique of the treatment of working class farmers during the depression in his novel called The Grapes of Wrath. With this evidence, we can assume that Steinbeck sympathized with the poor. The next question we can ask ourselves is, are there any examples of false consciousness or do the working classes gain class consciousness? Well, there are certainly examples of false consciousness in the novel. George and Lenny often talk about their dream to live off the fat of the land, which symbolizes the American dream. They hold the idea that if they work hard and save money, they can similarly buy a piece of land and be self-sufficient, even during the Depression. However, after a series of unfortunate events, Lenny, who many see as symbolic as the large and powerful American dream, has to die. George then accepts his station in life as he visits a bar with another member of the proletariat and spends his money, accepting the reality of his world. George gains Claude's consciousness after having killed Lenny. The third question to ask is how do members of different classes interact in the text? Well, in If Mice and Men, the ranch serves as a microcosm for 1930s America, and there is definitely a hierarchy. At the top is the boss, who represents the wealthy in America at the time. So he treats people poorly. For instance, he treats the African-American stable buck awfully, giving him hell. He's quite rude to other members of the ranch, but other than this, he has little interaction with them. He doesn't deal with them. His son, on the other hand, does. He's a bit of a bully, particularly to weaker members, such as the mentally impaired Lenny. At the bottom of this hierarchy, below the workers, are those marginalized from society and therefore marginalized from economics. This hierarchy is pretty telling about the economics and politics of 1930s America. Question four is which text, which class does the text champion and which does it critique? Well, George and Lenny are certainly our heroes of the story. And showing their difficulties forces readers to empathize with the working class. However, the boss who gives the stable buck hell and will kick out the old disabled candy is seen as a bit as a villain. As a result, we see the text championing the working class and critiquing the upper class. Finally, ask yourself, does the text reinforce class structures or does it challenge them by highlighting flaws? Steinbeck is definitely critical of the ideology which maintains false consciousness among the lower classes, the American dream. The text reveals it to be a fallacy which maintains class structures. Steinbeck similarly critiques sharecropping or working for just living accommodation but no money. Through Crooks, he shows how sharecroppers are economically tied to the farm unable to leave, almost as if they're a modern-day slave. Finally, the Raj's hierarchy can be read as a way Steinbeck critiques the economics and politics of the era. Innocent characters tend to suffer the most. They receive little help and they're lonely. Loneliness can even be a synonym for alienation. So remember, we can use a Marxist lens to approach literature as a way to tell us more about humanity, politics and class struggles. Ask yourself these questions as you read. Thank you for watching.